Okay, let's start with the second lecture. So we have already heard during Max Bond Basics that um, uh, we do the, the initial search and then also the main search with the Andromeda search engine. And here I want to explain you then in detail how this is done. And also I've forgotten to mention that before, so I will say it now. If you have any questions, then you can just interrupt me and we discuss it immediately. So um, you probably know that, but I want to still bring everyone at the same page. So here I will explain you the typical uh, shotgun proteomics workflow. This is done. So first of all, you, you have your protein mixture in your sample, which you would like to identify. And typically this is enzymatically digested into a complex mixture of peptides. And uh, the most common one, the most common enzyme is uh, trypsin that cleaves after arginine and lysine. And if you are specifically interested in phosphorylation, for instance, they are lower abundant and therefore you need to enrich for those. So there you can apply different enrichment methods. And when you have then um, the peptides, you separate them using high performance liquid chromatography. And after that step, they are then ionized and then subjected to them uh, to the mass spectrometer. So here in shotgun proteomics, we do a tandem mass spectrometry. And, and here we have the precursor, the selected one that is additionally fragmented in collision cells. So most common one, uh, common fragmentation methods are CID, HCD, and ETD. And then we end up having um, MS2 spectra um, for a peptide. And then we apply a database search um, to identify those MS2 spectra. And so also to explain you quickly how it's done. So as the name uh, database search engine says it already, you need a database. And that database contains a list of proteins which you expect in your sample. And then based on that database, you generate a theoretical spectra, which you then match to the experimental one. And the selection of your theoretical spectra is then based on the mass of the precursor. And then you have uh, a possible list of theoretical spectra. Those you then all match to the experimental spectrum. And this is called then a peptide spectrum match. And then out of all those lists, you would like to know which one is the winner. And for this, you uh, calculate then a score. And that the highest scoring uh, peptide spectrum match then identifies the experimental spectrum. And so here we have, uh, if you want to dig deeper into the search engine Andromeda, you can uh, look into that publication. So here we have two main workflows that we have to do in order to identify the spectra. So the first workflow is um, the processing of the raw data, the raw file for thermal. Um, and then if we have done this, we also need to generate uh, the theoretical spectra. And, if, and then we are able to match those and calculate the score. So now let's now go into the first workflow, the processing of the raw files. And so first of all, we have to specify those raw files in the Max1 software. And this is done in when you open it in the first tab, raw data, and then you can select a raw file, but also very many raw files. So you can analyze many raw files together. And yeah, then usually these raw files are very complex and we have to reduce this complexity. And this is done in the following steps, which I'm going to explain you now. So first of all, some raw files, they come already in uh, centroid mode, then there nothing needs to be done. But or if they come in profile mode, we have to do here uh, centroiding. And also for the later steps, the 3D information or is not uh, required. That's why we can do that. And then if the data comes in high resolution, like orbit, orbit trap, we can also de do the isotoping. Because with high resolution, as we've learned before, we are able to tell in case of charge one if two peaks are one Dalton apart. 
and then we are able to detect the isotopic pattern. But if you have um, ion trap data, you don't have such a high resolution and then you're not able to do the isotoping. But if you have the high resolution again, you see those uh, isotopes, isotopic patterns, and then what is done is uh, you take them out and then re you reintroduce the monoisotopic peak with the sum up intensities and therefore you reduce complexity. Then also um, when we know that the, isotope, uh, the isotopic pattern, we also know the charge state and therefore um, you can see if you have uh, higher charges for here, you can then um, join them together and reintroduce the charge one state. So here you also sum up the intensities. And, but also sometimes it's not possible, even though if you have high resolution, that you are able to do the isotoping because um, one of the peaks of the isotopic pattern can be very low abundant and therefore you can't see the whole um, isotopic pattern. And then you can't also detect the charge, which results then that we also offer a higher charges in the theoretical spectra as well. So we have reduced now uh, the complexity a lot with uh, centroiding and uh, collapsing the peaks. And then we even can further reduce the intensities. And this what we do is then that per 100 Dalton window, we pick the most intense peaks, the Q um, top intense peaks. And why it's for 100 Dalton window? Because it's the uh, average mass of an amino acid. And then uh, why it's called Q? Because this is a par parameter which you could set in max quant, but you, there is no need to change that because that is optimized. Um, only if in rare cases maybe you would uh, do that, but usually not. But that's why it's called uh, Q, because it's a parameter. And so yeah, so here when we filter for the intense peaks, this is also a noise filter. So um, we reduce the noise and so a quality filter and then also we introduce some intensity dependence because later during the matching we only match to the high intense peaks. And that is all what we have to do for the first um, branch. So here we are finished and let's now look how we generate those uh, theoretical spectra in order to do then later the scoring. So I've said already it's a database search, so we need the database. And here we uh, select, I show you now where you can specify those FASTA files in MaxQuant. So you go uh, to global parameters and here sequences and then you can add one or more database uh, FASTA files. And Previously, in older MaxQuant versions, um, it was in, in configuration, but this moved now to uh, the parameter settings and also the information which database you used and which uh, identifier rules, we will also learn that later what that means, um, you defined will now be stored in the MQPAR file and this also helps later on when you want to look up again what analysis you did that you see which database file you used and which version of it. So when we have the proteins, the list of proteins, our database, um, we need to digest those. And okay, I have here I have some more information what I should tell. So usually you don't need to put uh, contaminants into your protein database because uh, by default there is a, a setting in MaxQuant that adds uh, a list of common contaminants to your search. And this is good because it also tells you kind of a quality filter of your sample preparation. Um, but this is done automatically and we will also see then in the configuration tutorial um, where you would be able to change that. And so let's now, when we have the list of proteins, we need to digest that. And so also, so we have to mirror that what you did during your sample preparation. And so here, uh, you know, when you use trypsin, it cleaves after arginine and lysine. This has to be done also with the uh, protein sequences in the FASTA file. With the, and 
So this you specify when you go in max quant, you have group specific parameters and then digestion. So here this is already the default value. Um, and then also in case if you have, you did not use any, um, if you did not digest your protein, you can also set different settings here, like specific or unspecific if you haven't applied um, this enzyme and yeah. <coughs> So here we can see now an example. So this is the content of a FASTA file, uh, which is a list of proteins. Here you can see the header information that describes the protein sequences. And then we want to in silico digest those protein sequences. So we apply that rule based on the enzyme. So here trypsin would cut the protein sequence here on that positions. And then we have uh, a list of peptides. And now in order to get the theoretical spectra, we need to make sense out of this peptide sequence. So we need to calculate the masses. And to do so, we need to know which fragmentation method was used. And also the number of fixed and variable modification. And so here is an example. You can see we just took the uh, peptide sequence as an example. And then depending on the fragmentation method, you get then a different series of ions. Like here for HCD, you get B and Y ions. And like here, um, it would fragment the peptide once here. Then you get the P and then the rest of the peptide. And there, that's how you uh, generate those peaks. But also, if you have fixed and variable modification, then you introduce some mass shifts to those peaks. So for the fixed modification, it's uh, the most common one is methylation of cysteine, and here um, it's fixed because it always occurs on that amino acid. And so there is no version, uh, unmodified version, and therefore you also have just one theoretical spectrum with the mass shift and of that modification. But if you have a variable modification, like in that case, uh, on that example, you have a phosphorylation of tyrosine, here, um, the, the phosphorylation have a mass, and here you then shift for the Y-ion series, all after this position, all masses are shifted. And because it's variable, that means, okay, there can be an un unmodified version, but a modified version. So you have to offer more uh, theoretical spectra. And that, of course, then if you have many modifications, then um, you have also a larger search space. Um, good. So here I want to show you where you can specify those modifications in MaxQuant. So you would go again to group specific parameters and there you can select your modification and then you have the fixed modification and variable modifications and the most common ones are already pre-selected for you. Um, I can't show you where you specify the fragmentation method because it's simply not, you can't specify it. And why is that the case? Uh, this is super nice in MaxQuant because it automatically figures out it for you which fragmentation method was applied. And this is done based uh, for a raw file, for instance, you have the information in the header of each MS2 spectrum. And this is super nice because I can remember when I started, okay, I need to know which fragmentation method was applied and depending if it was CID or HCD, I had to apply different uh, tolerances and I had to know which one I use. And I, that of course, did also then you can make mistakes. And here in that case, um, it's taken care for you that it sets the right settings. Uh, here, just an overview about the common fragmentation techniques. So we have the common ones, the CID and HCD, uh, they are quite similar, both produce a B and Y ion series. For HCD, um, higher energy is applied and this results in a higher resolution. And you can see that it <coughs> cuts here um, in, on the peptide bond. And then uh, for ETD, it works slightly different. So first of all, CID, HD, you bombard the peptide with inert gas and then this causes then the peptide to break. And for ETD, you transfer the electro electron of a 
radical anion, and this causes then an imbalance of charge on the peptide, and this causes then the peptide to break. And then you have a different fragmentation pattern. So here you have C and Z ions. You can see um, it fragments between the C alpha bond and the nitrogen. And also um, here you can see for the ETD, you would also add uh, those elements to your mass calculation, and that's why it's important to know the fragmentation methods. Then also a quite new fragmentation method is UVPD. So it use, um, which is ultraviolet uh, photo dis photon dissociation, and here it applies a high energy photons to break the peptide, and here you get really a very complex uh, fragmentation pattern. So you have A and X, then B and Y, and C and Z all together in one spectrum, which is also supported by Max Quant already. So let's now look into detail a bit. So here we, we have learned already that when you have CID and HCD, you have to offer B and Y fragment ions, so they are always there. But also, as we heard, even though we have high resolution, sometimes it's not possible to collapse all higher charges to one, and therefore we also offer um, charges above two. But also if the precursor charge is higher or equal to two only in that cases. Then some amino acids are prone to neutral losses. And also here, if, if that amino acid occurs in that peptide sequence, we also um, take care of the neutral losses or include them. So here are water losses and ammonia losses. And then also the same is for modifications, that some uh, modifications are also uh, known for neutral losses, like here the phosphorylation of trionine. And uh, then also we take care of uh, diagnostic peaks. So in case of a tyrosine phosphorylation, you would also see a diagnostic peaks with peak, which helps you to uh, identify that tyrosine was phosphorylated. And yeah, in the configuration tutorial, we will also see where we can specify those neutral losses for a modification. Then for ETD, as we heard, it's slightly different. So it, it breaks, first of all, uh, here. And so between the nitrogen and the C-alpha bond. And then it has the hydrogen radical transfer. And then it, uh, you get different masses, which you have to offer. So through this transfer, we have one uh, C minus one and Z plus one, which is the Z prime. And so we, this is a bit the more complex fragmentation pattern. So we offer different uh, ion series and different combinations here, and so that we optimize the score. Uh, yeah, that what basically everything what needs to be done for the theoretical spectrum. So what we have done is uh, we process the experimental spectrum, and then we generated all the experimental and then we generated all the theoretical spectrum and now we are ready to match those. So here we have again, we see those branches, branches we've just processed. Uh, and then when we have an experimental spectrum which we want to identify, we have the list of theoretical spectra and this, uh, we get this list because of the precursor mass and then also through the individual peptide tolerances we can apply here. And now we need to find the best candidate that explains their experimental spectrum. And what we do here is now we look at the theoretical spectrum, then we count the number of total ions in the theoretical spectrum, so which is here. And then we count how many out of those are matching to the experimental spectrum, which is then k. And then basically what is done is here, uh, we feed those numbers in the binomial probability formula here. And then we can uh, calculate the probability of getting at least k matches by chance. And then we take the Descartes logarithm of it and multiply it with minus 10. 
and then we get the Andromeda score. But that is not everything what we do. We do also some score optimization. I said already before for ETD. Um, so here we optimize for the top Q peaks. So you might remember at the beginning of the lecture when we process the uh, raw files that we do some intensity filtering here and that we pick the top Q most intense peaks. And here we do an optimization in terms of, okay, before we picked uh, 12 peaks and then see how many are matching and then we go down to four. And so we start 12 and then 11, how many are matching with 11 and then four and are there still some matching? And uh, yeah, then we also offer neutral losses or not. And some, we try different combinations of ion series and then we take the best score of it to best explain the experimental spectrum. Now when we look at uh, post-translational modifications, so uh, let's talk now about this. So here we also know based on the precursor we can say are there any modifications and then we try different combinations to figure out okay on uh, this peptide has for instance uh, which modifications are on that. So you don't care at that point at which side they are, so you just want to figure out which modification they are. So is it one oxidation and two phosphorylation or is it two oxidation and one phosphorylation? So here you care about the numbers. And to figure that out, we allow we try out 200 uh, combinations and this is already sufficient to get a good idea about the number of modifications. And then of course later on you are more interested in the site. So here, for instance, uh, when you're talking about phosphorylation, you know a peptide is uh, double phosphorylated, but it has four possible sites. And this can get then quite complex. So for instance, um, for, for this two phosphorylation, you have four possibilities where the phosphorylation could sit. And then you, you try out all those uh, you have in total to figure out which one is the best uh, six combinations. And for all of them, you need to do the scoring and so on and so forth. And this, if you usually peptides can also be longer, you can also have even more more uh, possible sites or more phosphorylation, and then it can end up having a combinatorial uh, explosion. And to we avoid this, we try up to hundred thousand combination to figure out the correct site or where the phosphorylation could sit. And also in the output tables, uh, you get the site probability that also can tell you um, which site is the one that is most likely. Then we he we've heard already a lot about it, about the second peptide search. Finally, we're, we are there where I ex can explain it to you. So here we have um, on the MS1 level, we can see that there is an isolation window around the highest intense peaks of the isotopic pattern and this is the isolation window to select the peak for fragmentation. So here we can see that this uh, we would like to fragment the blue peptide and the isolation window is quite large. And so here um, uh, it's, it's, it's symmetric because of the, on the highest intense peaks because it could also be that the isotopic pattern points in that direction and that's why you need to have it that wide to cover all uh, the whole isotopic pattern. But of course this is then uh, suboptimal because you also fragment then the green peptide and then the yellow peptide on top and you have all those peaks then in the MS2 spectrum. And so here with um, the second peptide search, we try to identify those peptides, which are also in the MS2 spectrum. And how it's done is that first, because the blue peptide usually has higher intensities, and therefore it uh, will add, the search engine will identify that one first. And then when it successfully identified it, um, we take all the, the iron, iron peaks out and then 
we can try to identify the green peptide. Uh, the green peptide comes first because it's supposed to have higher intensities as well. And if we successfully identify the green peptide, we can then also try to identify the yellow one. And that's how it's done. And also here, uh, that works quite well we, because we have those uh, high mass securities and uh, individual peptide tolerances that also allows to reduce the number of possible candidates. Then let's now talk for the rest of this lecture, or no, actually not for the rest, because we will also talk then about Andromeda 2.0, um, about the posterior error probability and the false discovery rate. So here, um, if you imagine you get a parcel one day in the morning and you know it's huge and it's heavy and you know it's from thermo, then you might know what it is or you might not know what it is. So here um, it could be maybe a horse because the horse is also quite heavy or it could be a Q executive. So I think since we know from that it's from thermo, it's probably very unlikely that it's a horse. And so we can see here, um, yeah, we also give it uh, classes. So here this is animal, this is a machine. And you can also see that um, some classes, it's, it's very clear that this is not the true one. So you have different a priori probabilities that something is wrong. And this idea you can also apply then for the uh, MS2 spectrum. So here, this is an example where you have an experimental spectrum and then you have two possible um, sequences, peptide sequences explaining that experimental spectrum and both have the same score. So when you just look at the score um, and based on that you want to identify that something is correct or not correct, this is a bit difficult. But I think, I hope you all agree that if you look at this peptide sequence, then this is the most beautiful identified peptide sequence, I would say, because it's kind of perfect. If it's trips uh, that's tested with trypsin, that is fine here. It has no miscleavage. It has no modification. So this, this is basically super. But then you see another peptide sequence um, which has the same score and you can see, okay, there are miscleavages in there. There are two phosphorylations and an oxidation. So you would uh, also guess that even though it has the same score, you would also think, but it's more likely that this is the correct one. And so we have uh, certain properties on the peptide that helps us to better identify is this a true or is that a wrong identification. And this, um, we can use also those uh, properties to classify the peptide and then we can see for each class is there are different false uh, discovery rates. So here, as I said, um, you have, uh, here we have seen miscleavages and uh, variable modifications, but there are also other uh, properties we can look at like the peptide length and also the charge. And based on these properties, you can uh, build classes. And then you can calculate the posterior error probability. And here you also know, um, because we have a target decoy approach, we introduce decoys, which are um, peptide sequences that do not exist in real life. And if we get an identification for those, we know it's wrong. And this information we can use to, to get probabilities to uh, inverse the probability here using the base theorem to, to see uh, how likely it is it based on those properties that the identification is wrong. And then also for different classes, we have then um, a different um, posterior error probability cutoff to get the same false discovery rate. Then here in MaxQuant we use the posterior error probability, but there also uh, is a machine learning algorithm out uh, called uh, Percolator, which does uh, the same but using a different approach, but the results are basically the same. Then, so here we also the protein FDR is very important, 
and we calculate the protein FDR based on all the assigned peptides. So we have this is a product of all uh, FDR of the PAP values of all uh, assigned PSMs for that uh, protein. And also, uh, it's very important to set also the protein FDR because also here in that plot can say, uh, okay, if you don't apply it, you increase the number of identified proteins, but it's, that doesn't mean that all proteins in there are correctly identified. So you also should uh, correct, uh, check the false discovery rate on the level of proteins. And also when you have applied the protein FDR, and there are some proteins that does not make it through the FDR control, then you take them out. And since there are, of course, peptides assigned to that protein, you, you drag them with you. And they previously have made it through the PSM FDR check. And with taking them out because they did not pass the protein FDR, you also get them uh, for the PSM eventually uh, FDR below 1%. Then you have an additional parameter only identified by site, and those are the proteins in the output table that did not make it to the protein uh, through the protein <coughs> FDR, but you still see them in case of a phospho uh, experiment. You're specifically interested in phosphorylated peptides and proteins, and you still want to see them, and that's why you also see them in the output table but they don't make the protein FDR. So if you want to strictly have only those proteins that made it through the protein FDR control, then uh, you have to filter them out. And also as a take home message, you know, when you want to compare results of, of different um, search engines, then make just sure that you use everywhere the same parameters, because especially um, if you don't apply protein, FDR on one, but on the other, then you get uh, different results. Ah, good. So we are finished with Andromeda 1. <laughs> and let's now talk for the, uh, until the end, about Andromeda 2.0, which is uh, the newest extension of Andromeda. So here we support now with Andromeda 2.0 two novel scoring methods. So the first one is the tag enhanced scoring, where you look at the number of neighboring matching peaks within an ion series. And then the second uh, score is the symmetric binomial probability based score. And so I will explain you now the tag enhanced scoring. So the idea is here that um, if you, you not only look as we have previously learned at the number of matching peaks, our k, we also look at the number of neighboring matching peaks within an ion series. And so what is the idea behind? So here uh, there is an example that when you have the experimental spectrum that uh, if you have Can you hear me? Yeah. So in slide 22, um, I have a question. 22. So let's imagine if this is a phospho-enriched sample, mm -hmm. right? And let's imagine there is no oxidation on that methionine. Would you still consider that that's not likely to happen and you will take this as the better match, the unmodified peptide? Mm, no, so basically these priors are taken from the data itself, so it would actually see that it's quite likely to have phosphorylation on the peptides. Okay, so let's go back to this. So here, uh, why it's uh, interesting to look at the number of neighboring matching peaks within an ion series is because um, two consecutive Peaks within an iron series are the mass of an amino acid here. So if you have uh, the difference between two peaks, so if you have consecutive matching peaks, then it gives you a higher probability that this uh, is the correct amino acid sequence that is identified. 
So also here, um, there is an example that so that's the experimental spectrum. Here we have two possible candidates of the theoretical spectrum, and let's just assume that we have the same number of uh, peaks in total, both the same and also the same number of matching peaks. So the score tells you um, is then basically the same. And but you would know that because as we have seen the difference between two peaks is an uh, amino acid mass mm -hmm. and that the top one is most likely to be correct one. So we would like to introduce this information into our score and this is how it's done. So we have seen previously this is the, uh, the formula that we used and we have our n and our k and we have to introduce this information we have to modify our k. So what we do here is that um, we replace it by, we split it up, so we have our k0, and this means uh, that we don't have any neighbors matching within an ion series, and we uh, multiply it by a weight. And then we have our k1, and we this one has one neighbor matching within an ion series, and is multiplied by a weight, and then we have we do the same for if we have two neighbors matching. And then we, we sum it up and then we calculate the score. And so here we did some optimization of the weights. And then also um, based on this HLA data set, which was provided by the HEC lab, um, we tried it out over uh, different fragmentation methods. And we can see that for all of the fragmentation method, we could increase the identified PSMs. Um, yeah. And then for the symmetric binomial probability based scoring, we use um, predicted intensities for the theoretical spectrum by uh, machine learning tools. And so what is the idea behind it? <coughs> so the intensity information in the spectrum is highly informative and this should then also help to ident uh, better identify the spectrum. And so previously, or until now the search engine not really make use out of it. So Andromeda gives higher weights to high intense peaks, but until now it's not really taken care of or considered if a peak is expected to be high intense based on the sequence context. And this we would like to introduce into this scoring. So here uh, is an example again, we have an experimental spectrum and then a two possible theoretical one and we can see that the top one matches to higher intense peaks whereas the below one matches to lower intense peaks. However, it's again the same uh, N and K value so again both would have the same score but it's, it's yeah, this, the top one matches to higher intense peaks and that's why it's also most likely to be the correct one. So here we would have then, so this, this is the theoretical spectrum without any intensity information. And then if we apply a machine learning model for prediction, we have then also the intensities in the theoretical spectrum, which we can then make use of. And then it also would help to see okay, we have here matches to high intense peaks and then here matches to uh, lower intense peaks. And so how it's done here is, um, maybe you all can remember also that we did for the experimental spectrum the top Q most intense peak filtering. And this was previously not possible on the theoretical <laughs> side because we had not the intensity information. So now we can do also this on the theoretical side because we can predict those intensities. And so we also do the same here that we first of all offer all the peaks in the theoretical spectrum and see how many are matching. But then we offer only 13 and then 10 and then we see how many are matching. Uh, so there is also then an um, optimization done on this. And we call it also symmetric because now we are on both sides able to um, get the most intense peaks out. Uh, yeah, basically, this is what I showed you before that when we have now the intensities, it should help that we can identify this spectrum as the correct one.
So here, uh, in order to get those intensities, we developed two machine learning models in uh, collaboration with Verily Life Sciences. So the first one is DeepMass Prism, which is a recurrent neural network, and it's very accurate and trained based on a large data set that covers uh, most analysis you, what you would do. And, but it's very, uh, you, you need a, a lot of uh, resources to train. And so that's why we offer a second model, which is called Winner. This is, uh, uses a sliding window approach that is centered around the bond of which the, where we want to predict the intensity. And then, so this is slightly less accurate, but it has the advantage that it's uh, easily retrainable, so it's quite fast. And so you can also apply it when you have specific data sets where you know that is not covered in the training set of the deep mass prism because it's very, very special, then you would need to do retraining and therefore you need a very fast model where you can do that and therefore you get then also very accurate results. So for this we recently uh, published this, so if you want to look detail, uh, deeper into this and see what is exactly done here, um, yeah, recommend you to read that. Then also, um, we also looked at what, uh, here this is an example that you can see that if you have the intensity informed uh, Andromeda score that it really helps you to identify uh, the correct spectrum. And so for instance here we have, uh, we did not introduce the intensities into the scoring and we have an incorrect PSM. And why do we know that is because we uh, analyzed here Asotentic peptide library where we know the ground truth. So here uh, in that case we can see uh, there is an amino acid swap and when we use the predicted intensities we were able to identify the correct PSM even though it's just an amino acid swap. That is then another example where uh, we have completely different peptide sequences and with the intensity informed scoring we could uh, identified in the correct sequence. Then overall, so this is a plot where we can see where we scanned over the whole uh, Q values, uh, where we can see that with the intensity informed Andromeda score, we can increase the identification rate. And so this is until one of the iron specifically in, in the high regions, we can see that the difference is largest in the lower regions of the Q value. And so as an overview, so what is done here, um, in Max Bond during the search you have then the peptide and there you want to get the intensities. So you predict those and then you get the intensity values and this you can then make use of in the Andromeda search. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions.